Hello, Simon. Hello, Doug. Hello, Doug. <laughs> so happy. I, it's somewhat. Sorry to hear about Dan, by the way. I didn't know. Yeah, that, that took me by surprise. I didn't realize he was sick. Uh, I guess it explains why he was rolling off stuff, but I didn't know. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know whether he uh, stepped down as, as director because of that, or executive director because of that, or whether um, he was you know, right. looking for something else to work on or whatever. Yeah, it was sad. He, didn't, he, was, he seemed to, well, I guess age is relative, but I'm getting up there, but he didn't seem that old. <laughs> no, he didn't actually. No. Uh, I have a, are we covering um, uh, the pull request 722 today? Uh, which one is 722? Hold on. That's the one on um, schema registry rep replication. Yeah, I was going to have um, Clemens at least introduce it. I don't think we can approve it today because I think it's bigger change than people know about and they need more than one week to review. Okay. Um, I just had a question on one of the comments that you made and uh, regarding the uh, epoch. I've been gone for a few weeks, so I wasn't sure if that was still open. I was, I'll ask when you guys cover that. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Matt, are you there? Oh, oh, it's out, Matt. I'll go Matthew. Enter. Okay, thank you. Hi, Eric. Hello. How's it going? It's a slow start, but not bad. <laughs> yep, I hear you. Hey, Tommy. Yo. Yo. So I got to ask, I'm on a different external monitor today. Does the screen share look any different from it than the way it normally looks? Like maybe CRISPR? I personally think it does, but that's just my comment. I know that people have commented maybe three or four sessions ago that it was hard to read. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally think it's fine. Okay. I'm just curious because well, I'm, I'm still in my wife's monitor today. So I, was, and I always thought it was at a better resolution, but I could never, I never knew whether the monitor actually influenced what you actually shared because it would seem weird to me that it would influence it that much, but maybe it does. So yeah. first thing, you need to upgrade your monitor. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the second part, I don't know if the monitor makes a difference. I have a 4K that uh, people complain about that I have to change it every time I share. Well, yeah, that, that's a different issue, yes. Uh, that is true. I know, the, I know that in the resolution will change depending on the monitor, that's for sure. 
but I didn't know whether the actual Christmas would change as well. I guess I guess they're kind of they could be related. So never mind. All right, hey Christoph. Hey, how are you? Good about you. Yep, and Ginger. Hey, Doug. Hello. So please let me know. Um, I know I mentioned this last week. Um, the guys working outside, uh, they were further away. Now they're like within 10 feet of me. So let me know if I need to go on mute more often. But if you guys don't hear the banging, I'm going to be blown away. But let me know. Hey, Timur. Hey, Doug. And Brian. Oh, no, Matt can't. Um... Hey, Brian. Hello, Doug. Hi, Manuel. Hello. Slinky. Hey. hey. And somebody else went flying by. Oh, Lou, are you there? Lou Dang? Lou or Anish, are you there? Hey, Doug. Hey, oh, uh, I'm here. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> Sorry. And Lou. I was okay. muted. Yep, not a problem. Just give another minute or two. I'll get started. Morning, Mark. Hey, Doug. Happy Cloud Events Day. <laughs> yes, it, it's a sign that the week's almost over. It's so exciting. <laughs> Oh. Okay, I am not even going to attempt this name. Um, if your name is Z B Y N E K, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Excellent. Hello. <laughs> and I can't remember if this is your first call or not. You think with a name like that, I'd remember. But if it, if it is your first time, can you in the chat just let me know? I've been here before, like maybe. Month ago, or something oh, okay. Like that. So I probably have your company name associated with you then. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Red Hat. So I'm like from Red System. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, somebody else jumped in there. Oh, Klaus. Yeah. Hi, Doc. Hello. And Christian. Oh, gotcha. Hello. All right. Wait till three after them. We'll <clears throat> jump into it. Actually, let me. Oh, hey, Lance. Let me ping Clemens because he opened an issue. I want to make sure we talk about it. So let me ping him. Why wow, am I machine slow? All right, let's see. Three after. Is anybody I missed? I got that, everybody. Okay, cool. All right, let's jump right into it. Um, okay, skip the AIs. Anything from the community people would like to bring up that's not on the agenda? Okay, just a reminder, we have two office hours for KubeCon. We'll be looking for volunteers. Please reach out to me if you're interested or can join the, uh, the session. Um, okay, this week we will have an, a discovery interrupt call after this call, uh, as soon as this one ends. Um, we do have some topics to discuss there. So if you're working on implementation, please try to join if you can. Um, in particular, I'm curious to know about whether people are uh, running into the same spec issues that I'm running into. And, and I don't want to do PRs if I'm the only one seeing them. 
Uh, Timur, anything from the workflow subgroup? Uh, yeah, we're currently working on release on the, on the release of so doing all the branches and tags and everything for both the specification and the SDK. So trying to get that done before KubeCon. Um, so it's going to be version 0 0.5. That's what we decided. And then we're from then on going to work on a 1.0 release, hopefully within the next, I don't know how many months, but that's it. Right, cool. Any questions? All right, cool. Thank you very much. All right, before we jump into the PRs and stuff, um, are there any topics people thought I should have added to the agenda that I skipped? Okay, in that case, <clears throat> this one's from Jim and he's not on the call. Um, this is, I think it's a syntactical thing, just adding it to the list of protocol bindings. Um, I just, I guess, I don't know why I hesitated, but I did. Anybody see any reason why this should not be added to the list of protocol bindings? Although, wait a minute, this is in WebSockets. Is this a WebSocket thing, or is, should this be something at the README level? Does anybody know the difference? Oh, this is I. This is uh, to use the proto buff. Part, uh, even format in the WebSocket protocol binding. So you're saying this is okay the way it is? Yeah, just it needs to be formatted, but it's fine. Okay. Anybody disagree? Okay. Can you show the description again? Yep. Uh, Okay. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. It's fine for me. All right. Cool. Thank you. All right. Um, oh, Clemens, you're on. Good. I was hoping you joined so you could talk to this one. I was also hoping I would. Now, this one, um, I think people will need more time to review it. So maybe you just yeah. quickly intro, intro it for people. Yeah, that's that's what I want to do. Um, so what this does. Um, is uh, it adds replication to a replication model to the schema registry, um, which is something that um, since we have already implemented, this is something that arose in our world. Um, and um, so I want to share this. Um, we're going to read this from the bottom to the top. Okay, hold on a second. Here we go. Uh, not quite that, that low. Yeah, okay. All right, so here. Um, there are two events that I'm adding, um, and which are, there's a delete event and there's an update event. Um, and so they will, um, so that's the first time I think we define cloud events and cloud events, mm -hmm. uh, unless there is, there are events already in the discovery spec. Um, but I'm basically, I'm basically having two events for state changes. The update is really an upsert, um, but I, I just want to keep that simple. And uh, what that does is um, it, it indicate the source is always the base URI of the schema registry that's raising it. So that's that's also the way you subscribe. So when we go in and register a schema registry uh, in discovery, then the subscription um, uh, uh, found the subscription endpoint would basically also be that. Um, the event type is then, um, you know, the update or the the delete. I have a I have a I have a typo in the second one. Uh, in delete, that should be delete. And then the subject is the object that has been created or updated. So that's effectively we have this this path hierarchy. Um, if you remember schema groups, um, the name of the schema group, and then schemas, the name of the schema. So that's kind of the path. And that's what we use, would be used here as a subject. So you know what object that is about and then the time of change. And um, you would have not, there would be no body. Um, and the reason for that is, is that those objects, particularly these shape schema documents might be quite large and they might exceed our assumed maximum size that we set of, uh, of 64K per, per event. So the assumption here is that, uh, and that's aligned also aligned with, with the guidance that we give customers, 
um, for, for these kinds of notifications. Patch that document. Um, the use case for these events is that you can, uh, is replication that you have a, a registry. So think you have a um, event broker that is connecting to another event broker in, in kind of a replication, in a replication model. So you have a event broker that you're publishing to in, in one application, and then you have another application that has an, ha also has an event broker, and you're replicating events between those two. Of course, and then assume that the publisher to the first event broker uh, can only see its event broker, and the consumer from the other event broker can only see its event broker, which means they might not have access to the schemas, which means along the replication path for the events, we also need to be able to go and replicate events, uh, the schemas. And so what this will do is it will allow the, the event brokers to subscribe to schema changes amongst each other so that they can go and effectively replicate the schemas um, uh, between them. And then I'm describing in the spec, describing for the rules. So when you establish such a relationship, what you would do first is that the subscriber, which I call the target, would first go and walk up to the source, regi the source registry, traverse the, the object graph and basically grab whatever um, uh, schemas that are, are available uh, within the schema group or the entire registry. And then whenever there's a schema, when there, when there's a state change, it will go and be notified and then would go and grab the delta um, as the, the, the events indicate. Now we're introduced, so with this, we're now introducing, now scroll up, um, all the way to the top of, top of the changes. Um, yep. Uh, there is a... Okay, I'll go to the very, very top, here we go. Yeah, 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 there, because I'm introducing somewhere, I'm introducing the, norm, the, the notion of an authority. So the authority is right here. important thing, yes. Um, that's the key piece that requires a bit of, of explanation. Um, so, so the registry that we have right now is one that, that works nicely locally. So you have one schema registry that is effectively for one event broker and that works for you know, anything that's, that's local to it. And it has no notion of foreign or local things. It, you store schemas in it and you get, the, the, you get schemas from it. Um, if we're creating these sorts of federations, so if we have these event brokers where we're now doing effectively these forwarding routes, we need to have a clear notion of what the home is for, for particular schemas and who owns them. Um, so there's the simple case of, that I just described, um, simple in the sense of, of of straightforward use case where you have broker A, broker B, and those two need to go and talk to each other. And so you need to have a disambiguator between those two on who owns which schemas. Um, and then there's a more sophisticated case where you might have a central, central schema registry, which means you are in, in you know, a big bank or a big healthcare provider and there is someone has the job of being the god of all schemas, uh, those people exist. So they preside over a central schema registry. Nobody, nobody, no developer can go and ever check, check in a schema unless it's been cleared by the schema god. And so they are maintaining, you know, the grand central registry for everybody. And so they would be have an authority, which would be schemas.contoso.com and, and they manage that. So that's what that authority would be. And so in that case, all the schemas would be replicated from that central registry out into registries that are affiliated with the eventing system um, and, and elsewhere. Um, and you would replicate into other registries because of course you want to have your, um, you don't want to have your eventing infrastructure which might be doing you know, tens of thousands or millions of messages uh, a second. You don't want to have that dependent on some central registry tool um, that might not scale up to that point, but you really want to have your registries in a infrastructure that can go and cache them, probably help, hold them in memory and give them out as, as quickly as you can without necessarily having a, 
dependency on that big central store. So replication is something that we'll want. So, so we have these cases, so we have cases where effect we have a publisher authority, as I call it, or a producer authority, where the producer ha has some schema that's embedded in their code. And as they are, as they're publishing the first schema, they will go and publish the schema into the registry, and that 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 schema will flow along the event uh, replication path and be propagated into other registries so that the consumer ultimately gets it. In that case, the producer, the authority is really the producer, a URI that represents that producer. Um, and you have the center authority case where the authority is, um, you know, whoever the center registry, uh, URI that represents the center registry. Um, think of that as kind of the root URI for namespaces, if you think about that in, in, in XML terms or in, in JSON schema terms, that is what the authority is. So that authority is really um, directly equivalent to the authority as you think about it in a URI. That's that idea. And so the authority becomes a central concept here for disambiguation, where um, you can now go and merge schemas from many authorities into one schema registry. And the distinction between, between those is that the schemas that are from foreign authorities are read only, you can only watch them um, and you can use them, but you can't edit them. And you can only edit your and, and, and append and change your, the, 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 um, the schemas that are under your own authority. That's the, that's the idea so that we try to avoid replication conflicts and try to honor effectively where those, those um, uh, um, the schemas came from. So much as an introduction, um, otherwise you, I think it would make sense for you to go and read this. Um, and uh, we believe that that's a model to um, allow you know, multiple domains to kind of arrive in a common pool of schemas. Um, and, uh, and share them in these kind of integration scenarios, which we will certainly have a lot with cloud events. And, and ultimately, um, I don't think we're gonna have the central, the, the grand central schema registry in the sky, but, but mostly every eventing service, every eventing infrastructure will have its own registry, if only for reasons of decoupling and, and, every, and all the, the schemas that are landing in a, a registry through replication from, from different authorities are effectively sitting there as a cache. And because, because we have the principle here of making schemas immutable, the cache management is very easy because you can only go and add and things effectively never expire um, because um, uh, the versions never, the, a version is stable. So much for the monologue. Yeah, there are other places you want me to scroll to, or is, um... uh, no? That's that, I think I think the rest is the rest is all something that people need to go just go and read. Okay. Okay. Just I got a quick question for you on the authority right. stuff. Does the URI that you use here have to relate to a schema registry, or or can the URI that's being used here be completely unrelated to any schema registry? So it's exactly. just a string at that point. It's like it's like uh, XML namespaces, same same principle. It's a name that ultimately the one of the biggest problems we have in this in the entire um, you know, one of the biggest problems we have with the internet. Ha -ha. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the unfortunate uh, things is that we don't have a um, URL a, a, a URL a URI scheme which is useful for just, hey, this is an identifier. Because URN is unfortunately weird. So HTTP, I'm just using HTTP here, but um, it's really, it's meant to be an identifier. So this HTTPS schema schemas.corp.example.com is really just a name. Okay, because the reason I was asking was just whether a schema registry would know whether it is the authority for something based upon a string compare kind of thing. And I think you're saying no, um, if, they, if, they, um, if they happen to match, it's just a coincidence. If, um, I, have not, I have not made this, I have not made this explicit or I haven't really made a hard rule around this. Um, the, 
So a registry could certainly, a, a registry might certainly have an, a notion of whether it is an author, the authority, but I don't think the authority URI is necessary corresponding to its network endpoint. Okay. So, so, so schemas.contoso.com so schemas is more the URI for the, the owner identifier for the schema god of Contoso than the endpoint at which uh, the registry lives that, that the schema god manages. Okay, so it, it's fair then, to, I think, to say that an implementation of the specification cannot determine whether it is the whether it is the owner of a particular schema based upon this property. If there's some other information someplace else that would that would tell him that. Um, yeah, that that would have that would have to that would have to exist. Ultimately, I think a schema, uh, I think a registry needs to have a notion of what is coming from the outside and what is local. Okay, cool. Thank you. So there is a I'm I'm writing I'm writing that there if this if the authority if you scroll up I think down to authority not to the actual attribute wait up or down down oh, there we go okay. yes um, here for schemas imported from other registries and applications and errors the attributes required to be not empty if the value is empty or absent during import it must be explicitly set to the so it's implied default value. Uh, and the implied default value is the base URI of the API endpoint. So that's kind of what I'm saying. Like if you don't have one, if you haven't set this, then it's this, it's this network address. Okay, thank you. All right, anybody have any questions? David, did you have one that you wanted to ask? You, I thought you mentioned. You uh, oh, I, I did, but I'm I'm changing my thoughts now. I have to go back, go back and reread based on uh, Clemens talking. Okay, cool. Was it, was uh, were you trying to were you trying to push back uh, hard on uh, something? No, I was uh, reading some comments in terms of uniqueness and trying to identify changes. And um, I need to go back and think about it again. I mean, I'll go, okay. go back and reread it again. Then I'll come back. Um, I don't think we're meeting next week. We're meeting the week after. Is that right? Are we, yeah, we're meeting every week. Are we not meeting next week? What, what's? Oh, no. I wasn't sure. For some reason, I thought that was off the schedule. Maybe it was just my calendar. Um, um, I didn't, we may be missing KubeCon, but that's in two weeks, I think. Okay, my dates are off then. Um, I'll I'll make my comments in the PR for next week. Yes. And yeah. I'll, I'll go back and reread this. Thanks, Clements. Yeah, I'm 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 appreciating every every single comment because this is uh, so this is obviously a big change. Um, yeah, I just, I just had a couple Klaus, of comments in here. But, Klaus yeah. had Klaus had made a comment in the chat that um, he would find that authority model potentially also useful for for discovery. Yes, I mean it's quite um, similar, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So uh, ideally, we end up we end up with the same with the same concept for these replication cases because. Ultimately, I think ultimately this is the same story that we need for for um, for both for, for both of them. Okay. Any other questions, comments? All right. Not hearing any. Thank you, Clemens. Please, everybody, go and review that. Let's we'll see if we make some progress next week. I believe. I can't remember who opened this one. Is this Remy? Yeah, Remy. Hopefully this is relatively easy. So Clement, this one's kind of directed at you for the subscription API. Um, the biggest change here is, I, uh, let me do this instead. Basically what he did was you had the ID as a query parameter on all these operations. Yeah. And he, he wanted to be part of the path instead. And I think there are other people who would agree with that change. Did you have a strong feeling one way or the other? Um, I think it was not the get, it was the get on the collection. So the first request, the query parameter was part of the very first request. And that's something which was very difficult for us to implement. Interesting. Um, let's see. This is, I'm just trying to see here. Should have been part of the. Um, that's right here is this. Not here. I think it would be wise to open the subscription API spec, not the PR. Okay. What's the, what's the thing you deleted? That's 
Description API. Get that near the bottom, I guess. Thing to get yeah, querying for list of subscription. There you go. Oh, here. Yeah, I think this was the one which was really, really tricky. I mean, I, I think nobody implemented this. No, it's okay. it's a two or three two four two. The retrieving a subscription. Oh, okay. Parameters is an ID. Yeah, this is the one that bothered me. Yeah. But it's not it's not it's not necessarily this definition because this is pretty abstract. It was the fact that well, it doesn't actually show it here. To me, it was the fact that it's. It was a it was a query string here instead of a path parameter. Oh, um, that must have been a bad day. Yeah, because where was it? What's the, what's there's um, schema what's here. The, this this is this is the part that was the issue. Oh, okay. I get it. Um, uh, uh, boo. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know what I did here is, yeah, I think I've, which I was, I've just been a little cheap here in terms of the, the number of operations, because I think what you now have is you have subscriptions, a plain get on subscriptions gives, gives, gives you multiple, and then you do subscription slash uh, ID, and that gives you the, the particular subscription. And I think I just had, had those operations collapse into one. Um, if um, I have, I'm fine with that change. Okay. Um, Symmetry to the discovery API. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, th I think that's, I think that's fine. And, and um, I'm not necessarily always uh, uh, self-consistent. So this is a welcome correction. And it also that makes sense. Okay. I think where that comes from is um, we may have, I may have looked, I may have looked at some prior art here and, uh, and that's where that came from. But this, I agree that that's cleaner. Okay, uh, Anish, your hands up. Um, yeah, I was just wondering because in order to be consistent uh, in discovery stack, weren't we also trying to find out ways to query discovery uh, collections? You mean some sort of filtering mechanism? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think we made it very far th th down that path, but yes, that is definitely on the to-do list. <laughs> so, I mean, if, and I think we, with this query parameter, again, we would be heading towards something like OData semantics. <gasps> <laughs> so don't that, that, that was mentioned as an option and it's on my to-do list to evaluate, yes. But then I got sidetracked by other things. Okay. Okay, so I think this, the biggest change here was just the query parameter moving into the path on the gets more than anything else. And then I think he just expanded some things. Um, Clemens, did you want to take time to review this or do you want to let it in and we can fix it through other PRs later? Um, I have no objections, but I'm not the only person voting. But No, I know, uh, but but it, you're the main driver of this one. So I want to get your take on it is, first. That That is the truth. I have no pushback. Okay. Anybody else have any opinions on this one? I think it's been out there for at least a week or so. So it's not like it's brand new. Yeah, nine days ago. Does anybody have any concerns? Is anybody, would, would anybody prefer to wait at least another week before we merge it? Okay, not hearing any objection. I personally, I would prefer to get it in, not because I think it's, it's the best thing to, that we can do, but rather that change of moving it into the path is something that I know everybody working on the interop stuff wants. So it'd be nice if we were if the specs were consistent with what we're actually implementing. So last chance, any objection to approving? All right, cool, thank you. Next, get rid of this and that. All right, revisiting this one we started talking about last week. Um, I think we talked about that already. So a couple of things I, I changed since last week's call. Um, I didn't see, well, ignore the typo in there. I did not see a way for a subscriber to know what filter dialects were actually supported. 
the spec only talks about the basic one, <clears throat> but it does imply that you can define other ones. So I thought it'd be nice if the um, discovery API told us what dialects are actually supported. So I wanted to add a field there. Now, Scott, I think on the on the interrupt call that we had on Monday suggested rather than repeating the, repeating the word subscription everywhere here, we just say dialects and, and config and stuff like that, which we could definitely do. I don't have a strong feeling about that, but I'd rather do that as a separate PR that way we get multiple things at the same time. But for right now, I just called it, you know, the typo subscription dialects with a list of dialects in there and it is optional. Does that make sense to people? And here's a non-typo sample. Okay. Next, oh, I just define it down here. Um, okay, this one is a big one. Um, so I believe based upon what we mentioned, or we, okay, last, on last week's call, we talked about how uh, Clemens, you were saying, no, this really wasn't supposed to be filters. It was supposed to be a singleton, but then through Slack, you said you were wrong. It actually was supposed to be multiple. I was wrong, yes. Okay, so, so we can, I think, skip that one. Um, on this one, the config, did you give this one any more thought um, and to refresh people's memory? This was supposed to be, hold on a minute, my phone's ringing. This is supposed to be a map of additional configuration values for the subscription itself that are not directly related to the transport because we have a mechanism for specifying transport things, but rather this is a maybe configuration knobs about the subscription itself. Um, and the example I kept giving was, if you had a ping service, how often do you want the ping service to send a, uh, a ping, basically? Um, but there were other examples mentioned as well. Um, was that a question for me? Yeah, just so I'll, I'll, cause you, I think you were gonna go off and think about this one some more. Uh, yeah, so, and, and I, think, I think that does, that does make sense. Okay. From, and that is because of the, the the configuration effectively of the um, of the subscription of the subscription reader, I would say. Um, like in so in my head, there's a source, and then there's a subscription thing that kind of attaches to the source, and then there's a um, you know the way how you push those messages out. Um, and that's based on some prior art from OPC UA particular, in particular, where you can subscribe on an object that you need to go and actively walk up to and read from, where you need to go and take samples. Would fit in here. So that's what I was, was also talking about kind of in the last, in, as, well, as we were talking last. So I think for that kind of a scenario that those, those settings make sense. Okay. Anybody have any questions or comments on that? Okay, I had one. The value. I, I believe I wrote this up so that it could be any of the data types uh, specified in, um, in cloud events, basically, right? String, integer, time, whatever. Mm -hmm. As I was coding this up, I, I can kind of do that. That's not a big deal. Um, at least I think I can. The, I'm just wondering though, whether that makes life harder for people and whether we should just mandate it's a, a map of string to string. So this might be a question more for the folks who are actually implementing these things. Because when you deserialize, you have no idea what to deserialize it as, and it may not always be very easy to, uh, to get a type, you know, type information passed into your, your stuff. Anybody have any thoughts on that at all? Scott, you came off mute. Did you want to say something? Yeah, this is in regards to flattening the filter dialect and conditions, right? No, this is separate from filters. This is a brand new map of additional configuration knobs outside of filters. I got it. OK. I mean, we can apply it to filters as well, because okay? I think we may have the same question there. I don't have a strong opinion on the config. I think if it's meant to be opaque and passed to the subscription broker or manager, then it, middleware doesn't seem to need to care. OK. Uh, Anish? Uh, I think we've been discussing about having a schema for the subscription config, right? So that 
it doesn't matter what sort of what sort of uh, type you want to use within the configuration. It just needs to have a valid schema for unmarshalling. Okay, thank you. And Klaus. So, um, who is uh, the the target of that config? It's it's the event broker or, or someone in the middle, or is it uh, the producer? Because in the in the case of the ping source, it's more parameterizing the producer, and, and that seems a bit strange to me. Well, to me, this this field is actually used for, on both ends. I think it's used by the subscriber so they know what values they can put in there and they need to know, for example, whether everything is a string versus an integer. And then yes, I agree, the event producer or something on the subscription manager side of the house will use this to determine how to possibly um, configure either the subscription or the producer or something behind the scenes because to me, it's an implementation detail. It's just, um... I mean, the subscription may contain filters that apply to a lot of producers. And it's, it's kind of weird to me that I could also pass configuration values to producers here. I guess, so you're pushing back on the idea of whether there are configuration knobs at all on subscriptions. Uh, no, I'm, well, I'm looking for an example where this configuration is aimed at the infrastructure or, or some additional information is really needed here. Oh, 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 whether the infrastructure needs it. Yeah. Oh, that I don't know, to be honest. I, I, when I was coding this up, to be honest, my event producer is the subscription manager. So it's all in one. I don't have separate middleware, right? But granted, it's just a demo thing. And I, I wasn't sure if other people were going to run into the same problem where I need to somehow know whether this particular field is an integer versus a string and parse it differently, right? And I, and I was trying to avoid the situation of hard coding. Oh, I know a field is called interval, therefore it must be an integer, right? I, I want to avoid hard coding stuff if I could, at least for part of the processing. But if, if everybody else is fine with saying, no, it's, you know, let it be whatever type they want and the scheme is going to tell you that, then I'll just, I'll just deal with it. Anish? Uh I just wanted to bring the point that we probably need to outline the difference between subscription config and the protocol specific settings. Uh, because I, I don't know, uh, I still don't see a clear picture between uh, or basically the difference between the protocol settings and subscription config because they are very messaging, uh, very system specific settings which needs to be propagated by the subscriber, right? And ultimately they end up inside the, the, the event producer. So where do we draw the line? Is it a valid question? I don't know. Yeah, oh, no, I think it is a valid question. Um, you want to open an issue to make sure we come back and add some text around that? Sure. And, and obviously the result of that could be we kill off one of them if we can't have a clear description between the two. Or can't have, if we don't have a clear delineation between the two, then maybe it's justification for killing one of them, right? I, okay, I don't know, cool. but it, it's a good discussion to have, yes. Cool, let's do it next week. Then. I'll, yeah. I'll raise an issue. Okay, cool, thank you. Okay, any other questions on config? Okay, keep going then. Next was filters. Okay, this one, this is the big one that I want to talk to you about, about Clemens. Um, okay, let me actually hide the comments to make it easier to see. So in this particular, or okay, in my proposal, what I'm suggesting is filters is an array of conditions. And inside each condition, you can specify not just the, the, the type of the filter, meaning the dialect, um, I'm sorry, the dialect type property and value, right? So in this case, we're doing a basic one. We're just going to check the prefix of the mm -hmm. type property and it has to match com.example. Okay. What I changed here was dialect was not inside each condition before, <clears throat> which means you can have an array where, and, and these are all anded together, where the, where the operands for the and can actually use different dialects. And I think uh, Klaus raised a concern around that, whether that's adding additional complication and maybe we should only have one dialect per filter grouping, which implies one dialect per subscription. And I was pushing back a little on that. To me, once a subscription manager can support more than one dialect, I did not think it was a huge burden to say, well, you can do any of them then, as long as he knows how to do each one individually, he can add them all together because it's, it's almost like a 
not recursive, but they're independent processes, right? Each individual condition should be independent of the other conditions and you just add them all together. So I didn't see why we would need to restrict it to one dialect per filter. I, I agree, I agree with that. We have, we have um, uh, just prior art um, on that one. We have um, in MQP, we have new, a, a new filter spec that's just about to be uh, just about done. And we have composition filters there that are and and or. So this is kind of like here where we have as, as an and an implied one. And so anything that fulfills the archetype filter can be used there. So you can go and mix and match between simple property matches and SQL. So I agree. Okay. Now, in fairness, Klaus, I want you to speak up here. I, I, did, I was thinking about your concern there, and it did make me wonder whether there would be implementations that would try to take these filters and map them into some sort of SQL query thing or something like that, right? Where it'd be really, really challenging for them to mix and match in that way. And they were trying to encode all those ands as part of a gigantic SQL query. And I didn't know whether that was a realistic thing to worry about, or it's just, eh, it's interesting, but no one would actually ever do that. But Klaus, um, do you want to join First in? of all, I did some, I just um, wrote my comment because I, I did some research on how originally we, we meant this. Because I, I think last week there was some confusion. I mean, uh, is it just one filter? Is it multiple? And um, I just wanted to be sure that um, our original intention with one filter and multiple conditions was uh, made clear. And, and if we now decide to change this, then okay. So it's for me, it's just a feeling that mixing dialects is complexity. I don't know how under other filters would look like at all right now. But we can also decide once we have more filter dialects. Okay. Scott, your hands up. My one concern with uh, putting the dialect inside of the object inside the array of filters is that it becomes much more difficult to unmarshal those inner objects because you have to do you have to do a first pass where you unmarshal the, the object to just find the dialect and then you have to do it again to figure out what the properties are actually. The, if, we, if we moved it out though, we'd be limiting ourselves to basically one dialect per subscription, right? You would be, no, you could have another object. And so next to dialects, it would be. Oh, nest it. Right, to make another it. array. What other and people? You, you could do special things like you could have and, and then that's the array, and or, and that's the array or something. Are, are other people running into that concern where they'd want, I guess, these three things to be in a nested object? That way it can be parsed separately. I would prefer for or to be a separate subscription. I'm not sure he knows what he's talking about. Okay. <laughs> that, that's an interesting topic though. Um, no, I think what he's talking about is in particular for Go, um, he, what, he, what Scott wants to be able to do is to be able to look at the dialect and say, okay, these other fields are part of the basic dialect. Therefore, I'm gonna pass it to my basic dialect Unmarshaller for Java or for, for JSON. Okay. Whereas if I'm going to come, if, I, if the dialect is quote complex, then he could pass it to a different JSON unmarshaller. And he doesn't have to basically, and he can, he can, take, and he can take this entire sub object and just dump it all into that other marshaller. Right. Otherwise, I have to do it twice. Well, actually, if you think about it though, Scott, even if it was a sub object, you almost kind of have to do it twice anyway, don't you? No, I can walk the object graph. Right, like I can look at it as it's coming out of the tree. And if the top level thing tells me the dialect of the, the subleaf, oh, then okay. I, can, I can unmarshal that subleaf. But I, if I don't know the dialect beforehand, then I have to inspect it and then re remarshal it. Okay. okay, I didn't realize you were doing it basically a token by token kind of thing. Okay, gotcha. Are we gonna, are we gonna change, change the spec so that you can be more comfortable coding?
It's an interesting question. Um, because I mean, I and mean, that's the that's the 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 the. I think the information model with the dialect being in here is seems sound. I think I think I, I believe uh, the reasoning and and the the the. You know, we're talking we're talking about if we were talking about an object here that had. 400 fields, I would understand the concern, but really we're talking about something that's relatively easy. Well, Even with other dialects, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be exploding into something that's enormously complicated. Unless you're dealing with a system with several thousand filters. Yeah, I, 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 I understand, but um, I, yeah, I have, at this level, at this level, I'm, I'm not sure that that's, that that's something that would cause me concern in terms of perf to have the dialect outside or inside, or to make this a, a, a nested a nested grouping grouping thing. Uh, there, I would prefer clarity in the in, in the information model versus optimizing that for for particular implementation concern. Uh, Slinky, your hands up. Well. If that makes you feel comfortable, Clement, uh, if you look at the pod spec uh, from Kubernetes, like if you look at volumes, uh, they did like uh, like Scott is saying because of the limitation of the Golan parser, for example. So, and then, uh, like, and then like, like half, half of the Kubernetes APIs are then signed with this problem in mind. Yeah, but they they, they only need to be as fast as ATCD is, you know. Um, but <laughs> Um, I have, I, if you guys, if you guys really think that you need this. I, uh, personally, I'm torn. Um, I'm, like, I, I'm not, I'm not going to make anybody's life harder. Yeah. It's just, I find, I find this, I find this relatively, I find this relatively straightforward. Um, we could. I, I agree with you technically, it's Slinky. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm torn here because let's be cause, honest. Because <laughs> if, if, if there, there's so many things about Golang I would like to fix. I mean, I love I love Go. Don't get me wrong, but there are certain things around JSON parsing I would really love to fix, like the fact that he doesn't know how to handle unknown properties and stuff, right? But it it just seems to me that if I was writing the spec. You know, I, I don't. It's going to see a bad. It's going to be a bad thing to say because you you don't want to necessarily ignore the implementation, but if you ignore this, if you ignore the implementation side of things, and I was just looking at the spec, what I see here is exactly what I would expect. It, I, I would not expect the nesting because the nesting provides no added value from a from an understanding, as you said, of the data model perspective, right? Now, if we had written this differently, and if we had said, for example instead of separate entities, it was um, a list and the key value here was basic instead of dialect. And then it was an object with these things. I could, I could buy that because- Yeah, but that gets super clunky because all of a sudden yes. you're having, you're having a, a basic object and then you're grouping all the basic things there, and then you have a SQL object, and you're grouping all the SQL things there, and then all of that gets ended together. Um, that is weird. Yeah, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying I, I could I could buy I could buy a nesting if you if you went down that path. I just it, from a straight spec perspective, it's hard for me to buy a nesting here. Um, but I don't want to discount completely the fact that it may like may make the implementation harder for some people. I'm not sure I'm, not sure I'm going to completely give into it, but I understand it. I, I don't think I'm convinced that dialect should be mixed inside the filter array. Uh, you're back to that issue. <laughs> like personally, I think dialect should be moved up to the top level and it describes how you interpret the filters. The so let's, so let's say you had a regular expression dialect and this basic one, you're basically suggesting then that within one subscription, you could not do both. Uh, exactly. And yep, that's that's exactly what I'm saying. But why? Yeah. Uh, because usually you're going to pick an engine that you're going to subscribe to. And I, I think 
it would be interesting to be able to have that subscription broker say, actually, I only do regex. Well, you can. Each individual discovery, every single service gets to say which dialects they support. So within this- everything has to support basic. But, but I would, so I would want to, I would certainly want to go and do a prefix match on the subject. And then I might go and do some complex parsing of um, some other metadata field. Right. Or you, you do that in the complex parsing too. Yeah, but that would require every other dialect. But that would, Scott, that would require every other dialect to support basic. Yeah. And you, or you want to torture everybody and make everything work in regex. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I can't remember how to do prefix in regex. Sorry. <laughs> I have to look it up. That's why Carrot. you don't have any dollar, dollar bills. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Something with star, I think. So I let me ask you this, Scott, since we are running a little low on time here. Is this something that you feel strongly enough about to like hold up the PR or is this something we can re-examine re later? I mean, it's, it's, it's not like a technically impossible thing because this is exactly how like the GitHub API works. Right? You get the payload and then you have to inspect it and then you can re-marshal it. It's mm -hmm. just, it's cumbersome and, and now instead of doing that once for the payload, you're doing that once per item in the filters array, which is just cumbersome. Okay. I, I don't want to necessarily ignore the issue. I would like to revisit it. Um, but I do also want to make forward progress. Would you be willing to hold your nose for a while to, to see how, how other people, um, what kind of pains they go through when they implement it? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay. Okay, any other questions, comments? Ignoring the weird indentation down here, this is what the config would look like, just so you guys know. Here's a string one and here's an integer one. Doug's trying to start the uh, tabs versus spaces. I, I swear I did not mean to, it was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have a very strong opinion on this, but I will, I'll save that for later. Um, okay, I think this is just textual GORP matching what we did there. Oh. Yeah, this is just syntactical. Um, I put I lowercase these because I think that's what you actually meant to use in the actual thing itself. And I don't want people to get confused as to whether these were meant to be used inside of the uh, JSON or not. So I just lowercase those. Um, I think this is just syntactical sugar cleanup. Oh, this one, Clemens. Um, I was assuming when we do the string compare for all of these, for the basic one, it would be case sensitive and that includes taking into account leading and trailing white spaces. Did, do you agree with that? Yes. Okay, does anybody else disagree with that? Okay, cool. Uh, just some examples. Here's another example with an and. Um, what do I do here? And, and, and you know, and the reason why is as soon as we say case insensitive, we're again in this case folding nightmare. Yep. And so we want to go and avoid that, I think. Yeah. Okay, I don't know what I did here. I think I might have just done some wordsmithing. Now, yeah, then we I also, we also are missing an, an E of where? In 543. Will be defined with the subscription. Oh, manager. okay. Thank you. Hold on. You're welcome. I'll get that. <laughs> okay, and then down here, it's not really specky, but I just wanted to show what things would look like, um, especially when we start doing the uh, the ID as the in the path instead of the query parameter. Just just some samples because I like samples, um, and that was basically it. Any other question? And I'll fix them here. Let me get this. There's an extra eye there. I keep forgetting to fix that. Any other questions or comments on this one? Um, one general question. Yes. And um, did we at some point decide to uh, stick to the kind of naming uh, properties that we do this uh, like we did it for um, context attributes? I mean, without uh, 
uh, hyphens or without candle case, just the way we have it here. I mean, in APIs, it's more common to have something like candle case notation, I think. Which properties in particular you're talking uh, about? Subscription URL, subscription config. I mean, they are just one word without upper or lower case, anything. Uh, okay. The, we, the reason why we did that for for the um, uh, for the context attributes it, is um, that we were putting these in HTTP headers. Yeah, it's sure. For those, it's clear. I mean, <laughs> I'm just wondering if we need to do it here. Ah, yeah, we probably don't. So you're saying, for example, this could be capital S. Yeah, just someone asked me this actually <laughs> some of yeah. my colleagues, and I was wondering why we did yeah, we it. Had a, exactly, we had a hard we had a hard technical reasons to to keep it all lowercase, but I think here we can um, we can make things a little bit more normal again, and and that's that's a good that's a good uh, uh, point, um, and use camel casing. Okay, uh, Klaus, do you want to open up an issue or even a PR to for that? And we could <laughs> we can try. It. Yeah, I, I'm not hearing anybody object to it. Sounds like a good idea. Okay, Clemens, I forgot. Uh, somebody, um, Matthias, it, um, in the chat mentioned that I think right now the um, the schema doc shows it as subscription, not subscriptions. And I, I actually added the S here too, just out of, as a coincidence. Are you okay with an S with this being plural? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Any other comments or questions on this or concerns? Do people want more time to think about it? Okay. Any objection then to approving? Okay. Now we have five minutes left. I'm not sure how much time we can get. Anish, you said you wanted to quickly talk about this one, right? Oh yeah, this one. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I completely you know, forgot the discussion we had when we were talking about that issue. So I uh, kind of ran out of context. So I thought in that moment, we decided that we probably don't want to deal with anything related to security or the data integrity part. And that's what I was trying to sum. But I do see some important points being brought up by Eric. So I, I'm not sure whether should I address them right now or should I, or should we wait till we just tackle the security and the data integrity issue in the future? Can you, can one of you, either you or Eric quickly talk about what the specific issues are that you wondering whether you should tackle now versus wait? Just some mm -hmm. examples. Is Eric on the call? Like... Uh, Eric is there, yeah. I am here. Please do the others. <laughs> Eric, did you want to chime in? Uh, sure, I, I, they're they're not that important, but um, uh, I was I was taking a slight issue with the notion of uh, declaring that those ish, those matters, uh, integrity, confidentiality, and whatnot, are not core to the spec. I think they're very important, and we consider them such. And it's simply that we are not providing a solution for those yet. Um, the the second piece is that um, it. I think we should imply that uh, extensions may exist for solving these problems and that over time we expect them to accumulate into the spec as unofficial uh, extensions and that will well I, i've described it in my comment so do do we want to accommodate these things right now uh, because i thought like from the issues and clements could probably also pitch in uh, in the issue, we said that we probably don't want to deal with the security business as of now. So that's that was that was one of the reasons why I <laughs> was behind the statement of that it's not the core intention at the moment. Yeah, but by, by deal with, I think uh, the intention is that we don't want to specify a concrete solution. Um, mm -hmm. I don't. We certainly don't want to get in the way of. Anyway, I, I, I really, I'm really just fine with it going as is. Uh, so it's, Okay, so hold on a minute. Let's just refresh everybody's memory. Without Eric's comments, this is the current text. I'll give you folks just a second to read, it, even though we're almost out of time.
right? What do people think? And remember, this is for the primer, not the spec. Anybody want to speak in favor or against this? Mm. Slinky? Do we really need uh, the part from, we leave it up to the implementer of the spec to the end? Do we really need that part? I think the, the last sentence, every implementer has a different principle for enhancing their security model is already pretty much clear to me. Anybody have an opinion on that? Do we lose anything if we drop that sentence? Yeah, but I would still like to emphasize on the point that we can introduce it as extension field so that later on, if we decide to address these issues, then we can make those extensions as official extensions down the line. And that's what even I think Eric suggested. So at least it gives a it gives a hint towards how do you want to address these properties inside uh, your payload. So I, I still think it's kind of important. I don't know. So let me let me turn the question around. Oh, I'm sorry, we're out of time. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to rush this one. I know it's just the primer; it's not normative text, but I also don't want to rush it either way. Uh, so why don't we tee this one up for next week and um, take the comments to the um, to GitHub itself. Um, so quickly, did I miss anybody for the roll call? I think I got everybody. Okay. Um, in that case, please stand the line if you can, or you're interested in the interop uh, work that we're doing. And we'll talk to everybody again next week. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Well, we'll start the next call in about a minute or so. All right, Doug, I'm back. You know, I, th I thought you were going to vanish. Well, it got canceled today. So oh, excellent. I have to vanish. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, Clemens, before you go, I'm not going to ask you to answer it. Just take a look at this section down here. I started adding some questions earlier today as I was doing the implementation. And I'd like yeah. to get your opinion on them, just whether we should change the spec to deal with these things. Just later, you can read them later. N nothing critical. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. Wait, Clemens. Clemens. No, 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 no. I want to do that same event thing for the the life cycle of the discovery. It uh, sent, sent me a note on Slack a really ago. Okay, well, like, bye bye. <laughs> I thought you, but Scott, you had an AI to do that, didn't you? I had an AI to implement it, but uh, Clemens went and one upped me with an actual specification for it. Oh, see, I thought you were going to actually. Uh, add it to the spec. I I I, sh I shall once it works. Okay. And I think it works. No, I I was very excited when I saw his stuff in there because I, I I agree with you. I think we should start doing that for the uh, discovery spec. Yeah. Okay. Um. Let's see. We can go and get started. Okay. Um. I'm not sure where how you guys want to tackle this. Um. Okay. So we we addressed this one, and it was yes. Okay, um, so I had a question for you guys. Should should there be something in the uh, subscription so that the sync knows which uh, subscription each event is related to? Actually, I guess it's more this question. Right. So if I, when I if, if I get an event and I want to stop getting those darn events, there's nothing in the cloud event itself that tells me which subscription is related to. Not even an ID. Should I have it? An implementation detail. Okay. Should the subscription API specification define a well-defined, or should it define a cloud event extension that's optional to use so that everybody will use the same property? I think it'd be good to define an extension that's optional that kind of defines this. Okay. I think that's kind of what I was suggesting with the signature stuff, like make an extension that talks about how you can add a signature to the cloud event that's coming from a particular producer. 
you know, that, that same PR or extension could also describe why you're getting these events. You lost me a little. You said we, I think it's your, your use of the word signature that, that's throwing me. Well, so take, uh, for example, the GitHub events. Mm -hmm. When you subscribe, you can pass GitHub a secret that GitHub will uh, include as part of the um, signature generation process. And then you can take the message, uh, have your known secret, and then figure out which for which secret this particular event was uh, destined to. That's interesting. Because in, in that model, you're assuming each subscription to GitHub has a different secret. They, they should. Well, you may not though, right? Because I may say I, I have five different subscriptions, but I'm just going to use the same token secret or it's called across all of them because it's mine. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Uh, because that's a single subscription with multiple events you're registering. But say uh, you have different consumers that are at different auth scopes. You want to know the, when the webhook hits the distributor, which which of those consumers is uh, intended to get this event? Because I don't want to fan it out to everybody that doesn't have the scope for this particular event. Refresh my memory. Does the the there, there's nothing in the GitHub message itself that tells you which secret was used, right? There, there is. Let me look it up. Oh, is there? Okay, I didn't remember that. It's going to take a minute. Uh, you can move on. Okay. Well, Manuel, your hands up. Yeah. So I think regarding the GitHub signature uh, secret, that uh, it can be used to encrypt a token, and um, this is uh, so you won't wouldn't find um, the secret in the message. But isn't what we are looking for here the same as a correlation token and it is application specific because the subscription protocol would have an idea of uh, managing the subscriptions and when they are all multiplexed on the same channel uh, the events I mean then uh, this is is something that the subscription protocol or the the user of it chooses to do or keep it separate right if I wanted to have them separate, I could use separate transports for my subscriptions, uh, tra separate transport channels, like separate connections. Well, so, so our, 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 the concrete usage of this, in Knative, we have a single webhook that's registered to, to GitHub, but we have the ability to, to be able to have multiple consumers or uh, multiple, we call them sources, register uh, that they would like to get webhooks from a certain uh, GitHub payload. And we have the ability to, when we're creating that subscription, we point it back at the same in ingress point, but we use different secrets when, when we're doing the handshake with the subscription to GitHub. And then on the, uh, on the webhook side, on the ingress to the cluster, we look at this uh, webhook signature to figure out which uh, user created the actual subscription for from github so that we can route it to the correct kinds of triggers yeah but in the signature it doesn't actually have the secret right you you know the the point is that you can generate the signature with your secret and you could figure out which secret generated the secret yeah but don't but if you have 1000 secrets that could have been used you have to go through all 1000 until one matches right if, you, if that's the limitation that you have, then you should route it to a different uh, consumer, right? But for small numbers, you can, you could calculate which, which is the secret intended for. Okay, but I, I think, I think you're touching on a slightly different problem than what I'm focused on. So let's, let's keep in the Knative world. Let's say the same user in the same namespace in Knative sets up two different GitHub event sources, both pointing to the exact same GitHub, exact same repo, but just two different, in essence, webhooks. And, I'm, and now that, that, um, that namespace or the, the, you know, the sync in that namespace now gets two streams of events, basically. And, and that sync wants to stop one stream. 
how does he know which stream of events to kill? Because there's no, I, there's no unique identifier in the event coming back to know which subscription, which event source to, to, to delete, basically. And that's what I was looking for, was some sort of subscription ID or something as part of the cloud event. So when I was discussing the signature stuff with Alex, um, Alex uh, Collins from Nuts, uh, from, sorry. <laughs> uh, so when I was discussing this, uh, the I think the actual distinction should be made in the URL that you put in GitHub. So if you want, uh, you can have the same um, URL target, but you can append query parameters to make a difference. And uh, the same could be used for authentication. So when you want to have an, uh, what is it, the, the HTTP callback binding for cloud events from used from GitHub with authorization, and I think that was also Clement's point, uh, is that you have to use the query parameter of the OAuth uh, specification. So here, likewise, if you have two subscriptions or the two callbacks registered in GitHub, um, then the URL being used should be different, in my opinion. I I like that idea, and I'm 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 mad at myself that I didn't think about that because that's something we've done in the past. <laughs> it just it completely eluded me. Do people agree that that's a that's the way to solve it rather than introducing a brand new field someplace? Just say no, give us a unique identifier someplace in the URL, probably a query parameter. I don't think you want to. I don't think you have to require that though. No, 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 no. But that's, but that's, if someone says, how do they, if someone walks up and asks the exact same question I did, our standard answer would be something like this. And maybe in the primer, we can talk about that, but I don't think I agree. We don't, we don't need anything formal in the spec to say, to, to, to change, to, to support it. Yeah, I, I think, I think that's right. It's a implementation choice of the implementer and right. Like it's nothing that the spec has to say how to do this. Yep. Agreed. Okay. Because right? like best case, the source is the thing that's sending you that subscription. Right. Worst case, okay. you're dealing with a, some sort of middleware and then uh, the source is not the actual source of where the event is coming from or the subscription. And then it's confusing, but right. that's, I think you have to be aware of how your topology is. Okay. I think my other question here, I'm trying to remember why I even wrote this or what I, what happened to maybe even think of this. I was, I was basically wondering whether there's something in the discovery endpoint entry for a service, whether it needs to include the source value so that when the event gets received by the sync, it will know what source value to expect. And I don't know why I even thought about that. Um, but if no one can chime in to say, hey, that sounds like a good idea, I'll just skip it right now and try to remember why the heck I even thought about that. I'll hold off on that one. Should we support a not operator on filters? It seems to me that this could be a really popular thing to do. In other words, I want all events that do not have a prefix or all event types that do not have a prefix of com. I think if you do this, then you you kind of have to start looking at what like the workflow group is doing with all the operands, right? Like not an and and or and maybe XOR and yeah. Anish, did you want to chime in here? Yeah, Scott took the words from my head. I mean, if you're okay. going to not, then we have to also explore other things. Well, just to make it clear, or I want to make sure I understand. When you say the workflow spec, um, I'm not talking about not or, or, or doing or and stuff like that between events. So this is all within one event. Yeah, yeah no, I'm, t I'm talking about between the, the properties. Yeah. But would the workflow spec actually get into that? They have like, this concept of uh, making an object that has all of these operands that 
that you might want to uh, pr produce filters for. Okay. Okay, I'll take a look at that and see. I mean, these are like really complex filter operations. So there will be cases down the line where you would wanna have an aggregated filter criteria, not just one filter, right? So like combination of two filters in an AND criteria with combination of one filter with those two in all criteria. So we would have, because the filter object is an array, so you would probably want to also support an operator on the line for sure, but it would definitely get messy. Yeah. Oh, Doug, what, about, what if you had a dialect that was, so we have basic, which is exact prefix and suffix. Mm -hmm. You could also make a filter dialect that is block and it could have exact prefix and suffix as, as well. So it's the exact opposite of what the basic filter does. Yes. You're right. Right, like that, that would solve your problem uh, and not complicate the spec. I'll take a look at that. So um, we made the default filter language uh, JSON pass because we think of all the workflow data being passed around as uh, JSON-like structures. Uh, could you help me out why block? Where's the name block come from? Uh, it's woke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you shouldn't do JSON parsing because you 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 really shouldn't be filtering on the payload. Right, these filters are intended to be part of the uh, filters for the envelope only, not the data. How about regex? <laughs> well, I think someone's going to want to do a regex one at some point, yes. Sure, but again, only on the envelope properties. Yeah. Um, what about something more specific for the um, source? I mean, it's a, a URI, and just simple prefix or suffix is not always sufficient if you want to filter URIs. Would that be a reg regex thing? I don't know. Or maybe you, you want to filter on the authority section or just the path, something like this. Well, um, just getting slightly different topic. Other possible. Oops. Yeah, I, I think you're hinting at like a, a filter dialect that's maybe the fuzzy type where you can add in like a star star or something. Or like a template-based, or I don't know, something like that. Yeah. I can't get the word, the word block, it throws me for a loop too, but well, I'm not sure why that's woke, but okay. <laughs> uh, okay, you well, have the question. Mr. He everything, you know, we're trying to be inclusive. Well, uh, how, well, I wasn't, I wasn't picking a, a gender word. I, if anything, I would have picked not. How did, how did a block pop in your head? That's the, that's the new word for allow lists and block lists. Okay, that's interesting. Um, okay, this question I think we already answered on the call. People are okay with uh, keeping it generic types instead of just string to string for config. Okay, so those are the questions I had for you guys. So thank you for helping me with those. Does anybody else have any questions they want to bring up or topics they want to bring up? Um, I did add as I did add my discovery endpoint out there. It has one service inside of it. I have I not need tried more time to go and uh, implement the new specs that got landed today. Yeah, I'll try to merge those today. I think mine actually does implement the filter stuff using the PR we just approved today. Um, and I think it it seems to work anyway in my quick test. Um, I never got anywhere past the dummy data that I have. So I, I need to go and make up some services that you can subscribe to and get silly events. Okay. Yeah. I just have the ping service and that's it. I don't have anything else. Okay. Are there other things people want to talk about here? Or it's, I mean, I'm trying to figure out what the next steps are here for us other than. Uh, well, Doug, code. what if we do like an open call uh, to you know, interact with this stuff. So we make it like a blog post and we say, here, here's all these uh, event sources. And 
like one section is it's an open call to anybody that's exploring this to go and interact with these things. Sure. Um, I feel like we probably need to be a little bit further along with our implementation. So before we do that. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. But yeah, no, I like the idea. Sounds Scott, good to me. Scott, did we make the discovery endpoint public so that we can register a subscription API to that? I have not done anything, but I, I will add a dashboard that you can do that. It'll be slightly temporal. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. It might cool. scale to zero once you stop interacting with it, but that's okay. Yep, I will also probably wrap up my implementation. So we do have a call on Monday, right? I guess the same interrupt call. Um, did we? Um, I oh, can't remember. <laughs> Say it again. Do we have an interrupt call on Monday as well? Did we, did we agree to have one every Monday? I, I don't know. We can. I'm okay with that. Can you guys do uh, noon Eastern on Mondays on a regular basis? 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Eastern, uh, Pacific time? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. I'll tell you what, let's do that. I may need to move something, but I will try to adjust. I'll send out a note. Hold on. Um, Okay, I'll send out a note and try to get it added to some calendar someplace to make Scott happy. Okay, anything else? Or is it just a matter of going back and coding and hitting each other's endpoints to see what happens? Yeah, I wanted to ask about um, subscriptions uh, filtering um, because I think uh, in the original, or in, in some, at some place it says, um, filters like rate limiting and so on. This goes all into subscription parameters and they are subscri subscription protocol specific. Um, but I wondered if anybody knew a filter dialect that would allow rate limitation. Would it be a filter or dialect? A, or a subscription? Um, API uh, subscription protocol that does rate limitation. I know some uh, database stuff allows this, some query languages, but not the kind of event subscription that I usually work with. So. Would, a, would, a, would, would some sort of rate limiting parameter actually be a filter or would it be something more like a config thing? Yeah. Yeah, if there was something like in a in every one minute window, I want to receive only one message, uh, one event. Yes, I'm not sure I would say that's a filter. I, I would make that a config thing. It's in protocol settings. Is I, it? I, that, I mean, that's a very specific uh, feature of the um, particular subscriber you're connecting to. Some APIs have rate limits of outbound connections, like GitHub, I don't think will send you a bazillion webhooks, even if you ask. Yeah, I was checking uh, WebSockets and I think there is an ITF draft on uh, rate limits uh, for headers in HTTP, but I don't see that going anywhere, so. It's in section 321, subscription object. Yeah, that's that's where it is currently. Uh, yeah, the protocol settings. So, yeah, interesting. I mean, that's a very dispatcher specific uh, property or attribute, right? So this is something which, again, I agree will go on the protocol settings or subscription config one of the two. So that the basically the dispatcher is is aware about what sort of throughput it needs to be con uh, considering in dispatching those events to the subscriber, right? Yeah, I don't think we have any examples that take that parameter, but I, I think it was just more of a, by the way, this, this is where this kind of setting would go if you needed to implement it as a subscription broker. 
Yeah, the interesting idea I had was uh, if you took the timestamp and you would uh, box it into intervals of one minute or whatever, and then you say that okay, you'd only want the the first um, or, or single occurrence in every of those sort of could be expressed as a filter if there was a dialect for it. But okay, if, if there's no dialect, no language, then uh, protocol settings it is. I'm, I am kind of curious about this use case though. Um, because I, I could definitely understand it being a transport level concern, but I'm also wondering whether there are other use cases where it's not a transport level thing, but it actually is on the event producer side, because maybe you're asking him to use this interval to query the system to get the current state and send that out as an event. And maybe you only want it one minute versus every hour. And that way it's not a transport level thing because it's not controlled by some middleware sending it out. I mean, is that a valid use case? Yeah, if, if you set the sampling, um, that would also work. But um, it's rather that right. uh, different consumers could have different requirements for this. So I thought of it as being a subscription thing. Yeah, but if it is, if it is yeah. something that controls the sampling at the producer side, then I, then it wouldn't be a protocol setting thing, right? It'd be more something more like a, a config setting, I would think. But I, I think the point is that it's not necessarily specific to the events that are flowing through that broker, but it's the subscription that you've asked that broker to do for you. And so regardless of the th um, what the event shape is and what you want to filter, you could put additional requirements on the broker for this, but how to handle this particular subscription. And that's where like QPS or rate limiting or uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, but, that, but that's, that, that's rate limiting at the transport level, right? Not at the sort of the producer side of things, right? Because the producers, I assume in that case is still gonna be producing however, however many events it's producing, right? That's well, you but the the broker could choose to do like a um, like a a queuing buffer for you, right? So you said you make it. You know, I I have some wacky subscription broker that uh, the protocol setting says I only want one request a second, but I have a bursty subscription uh, producer on the other side it could queue and, and only push one event to me at a time because that's a feature of that broker not a requirement of the subscription right 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 no i i agree i i, I guess what i'm saying is i'm wondering if we just it, whether we just need to make sure we can support both scenarios one where you are strictly modifying transport level semantics whether it's done by the subscription manager or it's done by some middleware like you're talking about scott but then there's also the use case of the producer itself needing to say, I'm only going to send an event once every five minutes, because that's what yeah. the person asked for. I have a new way to, to talk about this. Um, okay. One way to think about it is I think it's probably uh, okay with the spec if you add this rate limit filter. But in that case, if it's a subscription filter, it will drop events that occur during a that window that you don't want events. So. If you only want one event uh, every minute and you have a producer that's producing once a second, you're going to drop 59 events and only get one. But if, if there's a, a protocol setting uh, rate limit of I only want one a minute and you still have that same producer, you're going to get a queue that backs up because you're, it's going to try to deliver every event. So it depends on what you intend to, to mean by that once a second. Right, and, and that's what I'm trying to get to is I, th I think there are use cases for both. I think it makes perfect sense to say I'm going to control things at the transport level. And then and in some cases that will mean, yes, it's, things are going to get buffered, but I'm still going to get every event. And then there's something at the producer's level that means I want to actually control the number of events, not that I just receive, but that are actually sent. Sure, yeah. And I'm trying to figure out whether, and I, and I thought that's what Manuel was trying to get to is, if they did want to control the producer side of the house, um, is that a filter or is it a config thing? 
because my mind was originally saying it sounds more like a config thing, but the way you just now described it, Scott, I could imagine someone describing it as a filter. Because I think you have to understand which entity you're talking to. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably config and yeah. protocol setting for the broker based stuff. Right. So but then to circle back around to your original question though, is there something, Manuel, you think we need to do from a spec perspective? Or is this something that maybe falls into quote guidance section and we need to just put something to the primer so people know how to how to code these things up? Initially, it was just personal interest. If you guys knew anything, how to do rate limiting over those um, the transports we have. We support extensions and protocol settings, don't we? Do we? Say, I'm sorry, say it again. Do we support extensions and protocol settings? Um, I assume so. Yes, that's true. There's a min set for each protocol, but there's nothing that says that the, the particular broker can't accept more properties. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing to find here, right? Yeah, then I think we can treat it as an extension and let the subscription manager send that information to whoever tries to implement that flag. Is anyone planning to implement any other protocol besides HTTP? I am planning with NATS, but I'm really, really unsuccessful so far. <laughs> I might do Kafka if I can get around to it. The only way I was able to implement NATS was using uh, using an HTTP broker, so or that kind of a webhook dispatcher. <laughs> so, <laughs> so basically, a sidecar and that also in a Kubernetes context, and that's why my implementation is delayed. Yeah, sorry. What about you, Scott? What were you going to do? I, I mean, I was only lo looking at HTTP because that's the contract it's at Knative. But it occurs to me that uh, a good test might be exposing other protocols too. I would be surprised if Clemens didn't come in with someone like MQTT, but he would need someone else to talk to to make it more interesting. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean AMQTT is not that hard. I think NATS wouldn't be that hard either because it you depends. just need subscription. Uh, it depends, like what's the sync? So if the sync is also not listening to a HTTP protocol, then it becomes tricky. But if the yeah. sync is an HTTP, then, then it becomes easier because the subscriber is HTTP and then you can find n number of middlewares to basically dispatch it via HTTP via, right? Well, actually, you know, it's, it's a, I think maybe we were thinking about this wrong, right? Like, I yep. think that that's, so to implement this today, I think you would have to have a filter function, send events through NATS to the subscriber. Right, so I think it, every subscription would turn into like maybe its own subject inside of the NATS server, or the yeah. NATS server. So you use the NATS server as a transport. <laughs> if you just try to send events directly in, you need to you need to hook somewhere to actually implement the filtering. I, I think you need to do that on the other side of the broker. Of yeah, NATS broker. I, I was doing everything inside the subscription manager so far, and then dispatching it. Why HTTP to the sync? That was like really <laughs> lame. So yeah, but I'm still thinking what can be other ways besides that. So let's see. And it is 10.30. We're free. Yeah. 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 Okay, in that case, I guess we'll talk again on Monday and hopefully we'll have more implementations. I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm gonna try to start playing with your endpoint soon, Scott. I'll okay, well, um, ping me, I, it's, it's kind of demo code. So you, the subscriptions aren't gonna work. The, the only one that works is for the uh, discovery endpoint and this code might be super old. So I need to maybe spend this afternoon updating it. Okay. So it actually does something, but you can like hit the endpoints but don't expect the subscriptions to work right now. Okay, fair enough. And let me know if you if you get a chance to hit mine and let me know how it goes. Oh, I will. That's cool. It sounds like a threat. Oh, uh, wait, 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 sorry. Uh, you have a discovery service. There's no, um, there's no path here? Uh, no. Slash oh. service, slash services. 
Oh, I'm sorry. It yeah, it, it assumes that you will, you will stick a slash services on the end here if you want to get the list of services. Okay, I think I assume that you added the slash discovery or slash subscriptions. Well, actually, I do have slash sub. Actually, to be honest, I think it's that slash. Actually, maybe it is. Is it services or discovery? I think it's, it's services, isn't it? Well, I put the discovery in handlers. Well, ooh, maybe, no, maybe I'm wrong. No. I... And then I think it's the subscriptions. I think it's, I think those are my URLs, but, but if you, if you actually hit this endpoint, you'll, you'll get routed to the right one. So, but I do think according to the spec, you have to put slash services on the end of this one. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'll, I'll take a look. Okay, cool. All right. Anything else? Bye. Yeah. All, All right. right. See you on Monday. Okay. Bye, -bye. bye everybody. Have a good one. Bye. -bye.